Grace, peace, and mercy to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I said at the beginning of service, we're going to listen to the voice of the hungry. In both of our readings today, we find, uh, we find some examples of those that are, are physically hungry, and yet Jesus gives some responses that are, that are very important for us to, to look at. Uh, but first, uh, be, first, let's just kind of talk about this for a second, because um, hunger is something we're familiar with. Hunger is something that we're acquainted with, maybe even right now. Maybe you're anxious. Even this talk about food, uh, this talk about being hungry is making you begin to plan where you're going to have some lunch this afternoon or what's <coughs> maybe left over in the fridge of what you might go home and eat. And um, we're familiar with it. In fact, some among us are probably more familiar with, with real hunger when they have to go to school without, without breakfast or go to bed without any dinner. Uh, know what real hunger is about. Because oftentimes, if you're like me, and most of you are probably the same in this, is that uh, the hunger that we feel is more of a... Uh, well, it's not like, we're, not like we're really starving. We say that. You know, but, but most of the time, our hunger is that we want something different. We want something... Um, well, we want something that's out of the ordinary. You know, dinner was a couple hours ago. I want to go look through the cabinets and say, what am I hungry for? I'm not really hungry. I'm just bored or I want something different to eat. Now, now the example that I was thinking about over this last week is from a young man by the name of, of Gabby. Chris reminded me of his name. Uh, a young guy that we met in Haiti. He's a friend of Mark's who we were staying with. And, and Gabby helps uh, Mark do some work around the house. And, uh, and for that, he's paid a, a very small wage, which he uses for his education. He's, uh, I think he's probably 20, although he looks like he's maybe 15 at the most. He's still in high school. He's hoping to graduate from his, his, uh, his primary high school kind of studies. Well, well, it was happening in the evening. Uh, dinner was getting ready. We were all hungry. Um, we don't typically eat lunch while we're there, maybe have a little snack or something. So we were hungry, we're ready to eat. And, and Mark asked him this question, which is a common question in Haiti. Did you eat today? Not did you have dinner yet? Not did you eat lunch today? Not, oh, I'm starving, I didn't have any lunch today. But just a simple question, did you eat today? Because most people in Haiti, because of the poverty that exists, they're maybe having one meal a day. That's if you're really doing well among most. And Gabby smiles and says, no, no, he didn't eat today. And uh, so Mike, Mark offered for him to eat, which meant for him that he would make a plate, wait for us, clean up our meal, being patient, and, and then eat later outside, and was surprised to be invited to sit at the table and, and, and just eat. It's that, it's that reminder for us that even though we say we know hunger, there's people in the world that really know what, what hungry is. Because most of the time when we talk about this topic of hunger, it's kind of that we're spoiled and that we have plenty to eat. We just want something different. Now, I want you to keep that in mind, though, as we look at these texts today. Both of them describe those that are hungry, but nobody was starving. Right? Nobody was starving. Nobody was looking for just anything to eat. They were hungry, but they wanted something different. It's especially highlighted in the Old Testament reading today. Uh, you heard Grace reading it. It's a description that maybe you're familiar with the story. The people of God, they, they've been rescued from slavery. Now picture this. Here's the people of God. Yes, they're out in the wilderness, but in their recent past, they had been rescued from being in bondage in Egypt. Uh, God had rescued them with miraculous signs, miracles, plagues that would remind them of God's power. And so even at the end, uh, while they're being rescued, taken away by God, they go through, walk through a sea on dry ground as their enemies are swallowed up by the water. They've seen God work magnificently, powerfully. And now God is providing for them what they need in the manna, bread, that would be found in the morning, and quail, their meat to eat in the evening. And yet we read again, and it was a cycle that's repeated over and over again. We read again that they're whining and complaining against Moses and Aaron, where they point out, you're whining and complaining against God, saying, give us something to eat, God. We remember when we were in captivity and we were being held in bondage. They don't say that. We remember in Egypt that we had plenty to eat. We sat around pots with all kinds of meat to eat. 
You know, their, their memories were even skewed by their hunger, but it wasn't just physical hunger they were feeling. They wanted something different. Um, now, now the, you know, you read that story, though, and I got to say that over the last, well, in, in, in the past, I would look at that and I would say, um, how shameful, how sad, what, what, um, what shallow faith they had. That here God has done all of these things and they're whining about the food? Really? Are you kidding me? It's kind of one of those things where you look and go, what, what a lack of faith among those people of God. How sad is this? How shallow are they? But then we read in the New Testament, kind of a similar story. It's the story that maybe you're familiar with again. It's the feeding of the 5,000. We say 5,000, but that was the men. So we're talking about feeding the 10,000 or the 15,000, this group of people that gathered together. And, and maybe you're familiar with the story, right? We just heard it. Uh, there was not enough food. They didn't, the disciples wouldn't have enough money to buy all the food to feed these people. And Jesus knows what he's going to do. There's a boy there with five loaves of, uh, of bread and two fish and Jesus takes them, has everybody sit down, he looks to heaven, he gives thanks to God, and, and now they're being fed. They're being fed, this huge crowd of people being fed, the bread and the fish, so much so that there's, what do we read, 12 baskets of leftovers at the end. But then maybe there's a part of this story that, that you're not as familiar with. It's the last verse, Jesus said that he, because they wanted to make him king by force, that he snuck away. And then the very next day, Jesus has this to say to the people. He says, uh, why are you so worried about perishable things? Don't worry so much. Don't focus so much on those perishable things, those things that disappear, those things that, that, that will be taken away. But instead, focus your attention upon the gift of eternal life, which I provide you. It's a hard correction to those people that, well, once again, we look at the story and we say what shallow faith they have. What, how amazing that they're going to complain about food. They're looking towards food and they're looking towards fulfilling their physical appetites. And Jesus is telling them that there's something greater. Their spiritual appetite to be fulfilled. Eternal life being presented. Now, now we, can, we can look all we want at this Old Testament people of God. We can look at these New Testament people of God, and we can, uh, we can raise all kinds of questions about their faith, the shallowness of it, or, or, or how they're hungry for all these different things of a physical nature. And, and yet, to be perfectly honest, we probably ought to look at ourselves to say, how different are we, if any? I want to give you some examples of ways that we are striving after. We spend our time and our money, our, our efforts. We invest a, a, a huge amount of time chasing after those things that would be of a, of a physical appetite. All the while ignoring, certainly not investing in those things that are of eternal significance. That's what Jesus is saying. I want to give you some examples this morning and and I, I got to say that the examples are probably going to sound kind of harsh. There's, they're going to sound um, quite probably difficult for us to apply to ourselves uh, because they're, and you'll see when you, when you hear them, they are just plain difficult to apply to our own lives. Uh, there are things that we could certainly apply to the lives of other people, which is a whole lot easier to do. Right? We can look at the people of God even in this text, even in both of these texts, and we can apply these truths to them and see the sin in their life. But we have a hard time applying these to ourselves. So what I want you to do is listen today. Uh, try, try to set aside that, maybe that desire to be offended. Set aside that desire to go, I know somebody who he's describing. Mm -hmm, I know them up there. I know those people that are saying, oh yeah, he's really telling them. Um, instead, I want you to take, just even for a moment, to think that just a part of these hungers might apply to you. The first example is this. You've, you've heard it said, we talked about it in Sunday school just briefly too. You've heard it said those that are power hungry, right? Someone who is, they're power hungry. They want all kinds of control. I want you to consider t this morning if, if maybe you struggle from that kind of hunger too. That, that kind of hunger to be in control, to have power over other people or your situation. 
You want to have power that other people can't take away from you. So you do what you need to do in order to make sure that you have things under control. We might talk about it as, well, it might actually have a symptom of somebody who works a tremendous amount of hours to make as much money as they possibly can because we would say in our culture today that, that, that money equals power. And so, so if that's true, then I need to have as much as I can so that I can have control over my life. I can have power over the unexpected. I need to have enough in the bank so in case something happens, I'm in control. And, and yeah, we might justify it a little bit by saying instead, no, no, I'm just hardworking, I'm just dedicated, I'm just committed, I'm just a good steward. Um, but here's a, here's a test for us to see if we really suffer from this kind of hunger. What if, it's hard, but we've got to imagine for a minute, but what if, what if all of that stuff would be taken away or we would give it away? Would we be willing to turn from all of those things that give us a feeling of power or comfort or control? And we were to give them all away or have it all taken away. By the way, a little aside, uh, this is what God describes when he's talking about sacrificial giving. Right, when we talk about sacrificial giving, uh, God says, yeah, give it all away. Uh, give till you have to trust in me alone. That's really what God describes as sacrificial giving. And that's what I'm talking about. What if you were in a situation to where all those things that you see give you power or control were taken away from you, were given away by you, to where you had nothing to depend upon, you could not depend upon yourself, your bank account, your income. You couldn't depend upon, you had to be completely dependent upon God. You were powerless. You were completely powerless. I would imagine that some of us have a little bit of anxiety beginning to well up inside, if that were true. And, and, and maybe that anxiety is because, well, you suffer from that hunger just a bit, maybe just some. How about this example? This, again, it's a personal example. It's one that's difficult because we can see it in other people, but not often see it in ourselves. But, but what if you're, um, well, you've heard it said, right, somebody who's starved for attention. Because it's a person that would uh, long for and look for the attention or the affection or the love of other people. And, and to be completely honest, there's folks that are starved for attention to such a degree that, that maybe, it's, maybe it's shown in the way they dress. They dress in such a way because the attention that that gives them uh, gives them some degree of comfort. Or maybe it's a, a person that um, would find that in their past or even in their present, they would use whatever means necessary to gain the attention that they so desire, maybe even using, using their body for that. Or may, maybe let's, let's make, make it more personal for ourselves to say, instead of looking at those people that might be struggling from that, what, how do I am starved for attention or affection or, or love or comfort from another person? To the point that when that person may, may pass away, this is a difficult thing because it's terrible and it's awful and it's, it's heart-wrenching, but what if that person that gave us that attention or that love or, or that uh, devotion, so, we were so needed by them and we so needed it that once they were no longer in our life, maybe they left or abandoned us or, or maybe they've even died, that we would feel so lost, we would feel so completely alone and, and yet here's God in his word that is speaking so clearly. Right here in this, in this gospel reading for today, he says this to summarize the whole, the whole story. He says, I am the bread of life. Come to me and you will never be hungry. He's not talking about food. He's talking about those that are, that are hungry for power or those that are hungry for attention or those that are hungry for control or those that are hungry for attention or affection. He's saying, all of you who are hungry, us who are hungry, come to me, the bread of life, and you will never be hungry again. This is how the bread of life fulfills us. Right? He, he came into this world to live a perfect life, to die sacrificially for you, to ra be raised from the grave so that he would be able to proclaim to you that I've given you the power, even the power over the grave. 
He's coming to this world to, to live a life of perfection, to die sacrificially for us, to, to be raised from the grave, to say, I love you so incredibly much. You don't have to fight for my attention. You don't have to, you don't have to do crazy things to appeal to me because I love you purely by my grace. And that I've died for you so that you would have forgiveness of sin and everlasting life. This, see, this is the bread of life, Jesus Christ, who gives us the power over the grave, who gives us a love that cannot be compared. And it does change our life. It does, it does not only change our eternity, but it changes our, our life today that we would no longer hunger after those things of this world. We, we would do exactly as Jesus would say, that we would more and more turn from those things, turn from those things that are perishable. And be comforted by, encouraged by, strengthened by, fed by those things that are eternal. Even the very bread of life, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's great to worship with you again today. We, uh, we continue our worship as we take time to uh, be with the Lord in, well, in this meal of communion. Before that, we also give an opportunity to give our tithes and offerings that we might participate in what God is doing here, here in this place. And, uh, and continue to sing his praise.